So let's have a go at going through this. So this follows uh, the chart, and I'm going to leave the light on. And often I do this purely as a slideshow, but I'm try going to try and combine it this evening with the realia, the actual examples that I brought. Might not get them in the right order, but we'll have a go. So, yeah, the first grouping, we're on the monocotyledons, the single uh, seed leaf. And uh, just to show you a few of those, sweet corn is perfectly possible within our climate. But a lot of the fancy sweet corn, like this one, uh, I think this is double standard I grew last year. Uh, the larger sweet corn are likely to need a longer growing season. Uh, I have had seed of things like popcorn here, which are smaller, and the blue jade corn, that's slightly smaller, and the old golden bantam, a standard variety from the past. They're smaller, smaller heads of sweet corn, and therefore they need a shorter season and you're more likely to be able to succeed with those. But again, everyone has got used to having big, kind of American-style sweet corn, uh, which is actually hardest to grow. Again, so if you try and grow what's in the supermarket, it's going to be the hard, you know, a more of a challenge than changing your approach, your strategy, and actually trying something which is a bit easier. And let's have a look. This is the uh, female flower of sweet corn, and these are the silks or tassels each one of which is attached to an individual tooth on the sweet corn head, and each one of those has to get pollinated, and a bit of pollen land on each strand and burrow its way in and work its way all the way up to actually fertilise the sweet corn. So that picture of nicely fertilised sweet corn here, there's one or two gaps where they haven't got pollinated, which has changed the shape. But crucially, that means you have to sow sweet corn in a block rather than a row. Uh, that's because, depending on which way your wind blows, the male pollen from the, the male flowers that are at the top of the plant has to drop down and drift and find the female flowers lower down. So, male and female on slightly different parts of the plant. Uh, but yeah, if we grow it in a row, all the pollen, the wind could blow on the side and it could blow all the pollen away and we could get no pollination. And actually, when I do this, uh, some of the larger varieties, like that ink and rainbow, sweet corn, I grow inside polytunnel, which means I have to go around at a certain time of year and tap each plant when the pollen's drifting down and actually blow it towards the flowers. I can do that on a small scale, but on a big scale, you'd grow it in a great big block. Uh, so let's just think about that. And then here's, this is actually what I do if I'm sowing green manure, and it's the young shoots of uh, Hungarian ryegrass, which will grow from August through the winter cover the ground in the winter and then it's chopped in this time of year as a green manure and it adds ever such a lot of bulk to the soil or I can leave it to go to flower that's just when it's just coming up and yeah uh, big point, point relating to farming farmers used to sow a lot of their grains in the spring like barley and wheat and what will happen there is the plant will just get going like this and then spring happens and it gets warm and it goes to flower on a single shoot whereas over the last 20 years, the winters have been genuinely warmer, and you've been able to get away with lots more autumn sowings. So you sow it in the autumn, it sits in the ground as a small plant, but that gives it a chance, instead of going to flower on one shoot, it's what, what's called tillers, it creates several shoots on one plant. So instead of a single flower um, and head of grain, you get a dozen or more from the same number of seed. So therefore you can sow less densely, use less seed, and get more back. And this point of covering the soil up in the, in the winter and stopping it getting leached out and stopping all the soil getting uh, washed away is crucial. And there's the grazing rye that's gone to flower and set seed. Each plant of the grazing rye, somebody's done a, te uh, a study on it, they've lifted a plant with all the soil, it's got a very fibrous rooting system. And what they did was they added up the lengths of all the fibrous roots and they found that each plant had five kilometres of roots. And if you, that's all doing the same work as we've been describing in the soil improvement. That's the same as digging your soil over an extra time. So it's saving you a lot of work by sowing the good green manures. And in this case, this is in August the next year. That's when I can harvest the seed, save some, and sow it again. I have got some grazing rye, which I'll get packeted up by the end of the course. But of course, that's waiting until August to sow it again now. 
And then we're on to, uh, this is garlic, garlic flat leaves, uh, like a leek. And that will be in the spring, after it's gone through the winter. That planted any time up to and before midwinter, to harvest just after midsummer. And again, we're taking a bulb of garlic, break it up into cloves. Each individual clove goes in as a plant, spaced apart, and then that single clove forms a whole bulb six or eight months later. And that's a real winner. And this is one where I recommend <coughs> that could be a year's supply of garlic. And I say this a lot, but I might have mentioned it before, but yeah, that could be the first crop you become self-sufficient in. So if you get just half a dozen crop, uh, bulbs of garlic, plant them out, still not too late to do it now, then you'll get enough garlic to see you through a uh, whole year. And at this time of year, of course, they're not form bulbs, they're still uh, growing. Now, if I've got enough, I can lift them, and all this green bit and all the white bit, I can actually eat now. So instead of waiting until it's a bulb after midsummer, if I've got enough of it growing, that's the original clove. It's grown up to become a shoot. And that would be just equivalent to eating a leek. And actually, they've got very similar medicinal properties. Similarly with onions, I'll just show you a few of these. This is an onion that I left in the ground. It's come alive. This is outdoors. And now that's become a load of spring onions. So a lot easier to grow spring onions by planting bulbs, old bulbs of onion. Or also you can do that with shallots. Just eat the central shoots. You peel off the outer leaves. They're a bit tough. Inside, nice spring onion. And yeah, I've also got lots and lots of chives which are shooting at the same time. One more. That's a leek, which instead of planting it just at ground level, I've planted it in a deep, deep hole, and that gives me more length of shaft. <coughs> length of shaft. Uh, so that's the nice bit to eat. You can eat young leaves as well. But yeah, by planting them deep in the soil and having plants which were long enough to actually do that with, I've got a longer bit of leek from the same effort of growing a leek. And here's my onions just at the point where the leaves have fallen over. That means they're not going to grow that much more, but they will ripen. And we'll be hoping for a nice warm weather. And here's some more mixing with poppies. And there's the storing crop. And I mentioned to get them to store, we need to make sure the neck is really dry, with really dry before we can put them into storage. And there's onions, go onions going to flower. And there's leeks planted out. And then there's, I think this is a leek gone to seed. Each one of these was, was a floret. Each one of these little uh, nobbles has three pairs of seeds in it. So I've got six seeds in each individual of little flower. And I've got about a thousand <laughs> flowers on a head. So I'm going to get several thousand seed just by leaving one leek to go to flower. That's the value of a <laughs> seed collecting it. These are shallots planted out, and again, it's an individual shallot clove. will break up and form about a dozen, up to a dozen the next year. But this is the stage in spring when I can eat them as spring onions. So that's an easy spring onions. And then, ooh, yummy. It's going to be asparagus time fairly soon. Uh, and that's a nice three-year-old plant that therefore is producing full-sized uh, shoots. And yeah, this bit from the tip down to ground, and just below the ground is uh, good to eat. And there's a tool which has got a kind of forked end that you can push down, <coughs> a couple of inches down into the soil, chop them off below ground, and then you don't leave a residue in the soil and you get slightly more, more asparagus. But luxury in terms of, we're not going to get a lot of that, um, and it's nice to use just as a flavouring, but we're not going to get huge bundles of it. You need a field to get as much as you see elsewhere. And this is a polytunnel about about this time of year, and it's got mustards, different types of uh, Chinese Asian mustards growing here, and that's a, uh, a chard, a white Swiss chard growing through the winter. And here's some kales. This is a type of kale which has got cut leaved and also a, a red sh uh, <coughs> tinge to the leaf. Here's different types of mustards. These it is uh, giant red mustard, and I think that one's Swahili Ling, and Osaka, Osaka Purple, and that one, lovely Pak Choi. And that's actually taken in the autumn. That one, it's very light and therefore mild as a flavour, but doesn't survive the winter as well as the other ones. And that would be another general point that 
the tougher stuff which will survive better is less uh, kind of fancy and might have a bit more chewiness to it. There's another one, I uh, can't remember what that one is. And then we're on to cabbages. So I'll just stop briefly and show you. For break time, we've got Nemenia and Mizuna, which are two types of mustard. And in the bowl here, here's a nice, that's getting towards full size, that's red mustard. And if you try a bit of that, it really is mustardy, strong. Try a bit of that, pass it around. And then, yeah, there's a cut leaved version of that one. Let's just see if we can get a better example. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically the same. But this variety has got scalloped leaves. The whole leaved green ones, that's swaddling, that will grow through the winter much uh, easier and better than the others. And so just within that single group, mustard greens, <laughs> there's about six to illustrate. And then one or two cabbages. I'll just show you pictures of, these are heading cabbages. And it's got capitata, which means head in the uh, Latin. And some of these, these are maybe... Summer, cab summer heading, so they've grown large in the spring in, into, the, into, the, into the summer, and then summer into autumn, they'll dense, get more dense in the centre, and wait till next year before they go to flower. And so there's green ones, and the red one, that's in early in the year in spring, and then much later uh, in, the, in the winter when it's actually good to eat. And what have I got? The one I've brought today, that's a savoy with the wrinkly leaves. So that's grown all the way from last year, all the way through into this year. And we've still got a few left which we haven't used up yet. But lovely for winter eating or for coleslaw. And now we're into, this is the kales. This one is actually asparagus kale. That one is a, a moss curled kale. And the difference between those, the flat leaf, uh, especially the cabbage white butterfly, it can see that that's like a normal cab cabbage and it will come and land on it and because it's smooth and smells like a normal ca cabbage you'll, you will get cabbage white butterfly on that but that one, it will get confused it won't know where to lay its eggs and therefore you're less likely to get cabbage white on the curly ones and also the dark one, that's the Nero de Toscano which has become very popular in the last few years nice example and yeah, because it's wrinkly and smells different, looks different uh, cabbage white butterfly doesn't recognise it, therefore you need less protection. And normally we put nets over cabbages and kales. And one more tip is, this bit is the nice bit to eat, the bit in the middle. So I'll snap that off, but leave the outer leaves. Then they'll get side shoots and give me a second crop. Sometimes I'll do that before the, the winter. I'll take out the central growing shoot and have that before midwinter. And then after midwinter, it's got two or three months to replace that, that central growth and put up side shoots so I get a second crop and again keep on picking it down and you'll get more of it and then we're on to this is yeah about 15 pound cauliflower this is the heritage type St George and that one it goes all the way through the winter just with leaves on but with a big leaves and a big root system and then from the spring onwards yeah, into the spring that will start to build its curd or head and that forms about the end of April, so about six weeks' time. And in the little collection here, this is actually, from the Huerta, white sprouting broccoli. Like purple sprouting broccoli, but it comes on earlier. That belongs to Mick. Oh. <laughs> he, he noticed it had gone. <laughs> and the guy line. And then here's a bit of Pentland Brig, which is half curly. So it's got a bit of flat leaf. And this one, you can see it's also got white fly on the underside of the leaf. That's a minor pest, but if it was dry, hot summer, that would become uh, virulent. And then this one is special. This is, uh, there's a book here by Carol Depe about seed saving. This is a variety that she's bred and saved herself. It's called Cascade Glaze. So it's basically curly, and it does have a kind of glazed effect later on. Let's just do a couple more uh, somewhere here. One of, these is, one of these is asparagus kale, maybe that one. And that one is just a spring cabbage, and it's actually called a collard, which means you can cut them and come again. So you pick some off and it'll grow back. And as I showed you, as, as, I, as I mentioned, most of these are biennials, but in this case, we picked all this spring cabbage last spring, and the plants have stayed alive for another year, and now they're giving us another crop. So that's been in for two and a half years. And one or two more. 
here's a nice little sprout that's still left. But a lot of sprouts, this is the top of the same plant, and yeah, it's not forming uh, the tight sprout that we get on the side, but you can eat the tops of the sprouts, very nice. And if I leave that sprout plant in the ground, in about a month, that sprout's going to shoot and try to go to flower, and we can still eat the shoots, even though they're a bit later. And you can see it's a sprout because it's got rounded leaves. Cauliflowers have more pointed leaves, and there's a bit more black kale there. So that's some kales and brassicas. Calabrese, like I say, uh, different varieties at different times. That's uh, a Scandinavian type of kale, Spis bladena. It's got white flowers. Most of them have yellow flowers, so you can see the contrast between the two. Uh, but if we've got the ground, and we can leave them on, very nice to eat as part of your salad. And every flower mm. has a bit of nectar in, so it's sweet. Mm. So it tastes a bit cabbagey, a bit like mustards. Uh, but a lot of the mustards will have finished by then. That'll be May into June, where they're flowering. And same family, kohlrabi. That's a green one, uh, super schmelz, and that's a purple Vienna. And again, if I was looking at kohlrabi in the shop, I wouldn't <coughs> contemplate buying it or eating it. Uh, especially the brassica family, because they soak up whatever feed you give them. So they can taste pretty odd when you buy them commercially sometimes. But if you've grown your own, this stuff is nice enough to eat raw. You grate it, add it to a salad, eat it on its own, or you can cook it. And the crucial thing here is, see we've mulched a couple of months beforehand to make sure the soil stays moist, because it's gathering water into this, it's a, it's a hyper extenuated uh, stem again, so it's a stem vegetable. And by mulching, we've made sure that the ground stays moist all the time, then the plant doesn't get stressed, doesn't get dried out, and carries on growing like that. And what have we got here? Uh, rocket and other things. Oh, here's watercress. I haven't got any watercress here this evening, but that will grow through the winter in soil. You don't have to grow it in water. And I've got some little seedlings which are hopefully make some kind of a crop by spring. That one, confusingly, is called nasturtium in Latin. But that's what we call nasturtium as a common name. That's the flower of nasturtium where you can eat the flower, you can eat the leaves, and you can also eat the seeds later on, or you can pickle them as a kind of uh, condiment. And I think in this family, just before I go on, there's also Greek cress. That's a really nice general uh, salad. And land cress, Lepidium sativum, American land cress. And rocket. I haven't got much rocket, but it'd be nice to grow lots and lots of rocket. So that's going through that uh, Brassica-related family. And, of course, I haven't got any peas at the moment. I was going to bring a bean plant, and the broad bean's about two inches tall now, same as the peas, outside, sown in November, uh, without protection, and kept mice have kept off them. But, yeah, you can see the bi-coloured, two-coloured flower. That's a kind of description of uh, uh, where peas come from. And the various stages of growth. So as soon as they get long enough, but they haven't actually swelled the peas up, that's when any variety can be eaten as a mange too. So whatever variety it is, as soon as it gets that long, and it's the first ones that you've tried, don't eat them all like that. Let some grow up and swell up and get peas in. But yeah, you can have the same variety. This is actually the French Caroubi de Moussain, so that's about four inches long. And that's just illustrating. That's a, so that's my version of a sugar snap pea. That's long. And then, oh, yeah, when they are starting to swell up, before they get full-sized, they're sweeter. So that's why kids love peas. And with peas, one cultivation tip. If you've got good soil, it's a, a test of how good your soil is. Because there's this thing called pea bean moth. And it just gets a little fly, tiny little moth, lays eggs, and then the uh, uh, pupae are in the peas. So this is the contrast. If you get kids picking lovely peas that are sown in good soil and have enough moisture you're almost guaranteed to have no pea bean moth. But if you've got any old bit of soil and you haven't bothered to water enough and it's dried out, you're much more likely to get pea bean moth. And if you give anybody a pod of peas and then they find a maggot in or they've already eaten the maggot, mm -hmm. that's going to put them off for life. So this is, again, really crucial to get it right. Um, yeah, soil policy. And then we're on broad beans. I like to sow my broad beans again in the autumn because if you sow them in the spring... Uh, some of the summers, the, the weather is 
can be too hot for them to get pollinated. And what's happened here is these lower flowers have been exposed to the sun and they wilted, which means they didn't get pollinated. And now, that because they're wilted, they've closed around the, the seed-making bit and therefore you, you don't get uh, good, good pods. That's the crimson flower broad bean. Beautiful plant. And, yeah, the scent from broad beans is one of the nicest scents there is, strangely enough. And there's a good crop, so it's, cro it's cropping all the way down from the top to the bottom. And then we're on to the next one, which is French beans. So the previous one's broad beans. They're winter hardy. You can grow them through the winter outdoors, like, pea like some of the peas. But French beans, climbing and dwarf, they really need to wait until the weather's warm enough. Uh, this is knocking forward a bit, but yeah, I've just sown some French beans, dwarf ones, inside a polytunnel. And this is referring forward to the second half, but inside the polytunnel, it's going to be warm enough that they will be able to grow now. But outdoors, I'll wait another six or even eight weeks before, until after the last frosts, before I sow French beans outside. How do you recommend preventing black fly on uh, it does relate again to what I said about the soil quality right. and yeah, there is a, a classic tip which is you nip out the top of your br uh, broad beans and that, that's the youngest and therefore softest part of the plant where the black fly can accumulate and they can really take over and s stop a plant off or even kill it uh, but again, if you're growing in decent soil quality and you've got enough moisture through the life of the crop, especially just before they're forming their pods, then the plant doesn't get stressed. And that will relate to next week's session, which is pests and diseases are just telling us, uh, informing us about how our growing is. And black fly on broad beans would say, not enough soil improvement, not enough moisture at the crucial times, and maybe lack of certain nutrients. I do, I tried dwarf crunch beans a lot, um, because they hang low over the soil after the slugs. You're so generous to tolerate slugs, but uh, another tip would be if you had the, a raised bed, you could sow them along the edge and have them dangling down into space rather than being in contact with the soil. Uh, and yeah, climbing, that's just uh, yeah, runner beans and more runner beans. Yeah, I don't know whether I've got another picture. Let's just one, one on runner beans. Uh, we're used to eating runner beans as green beans, string beans, and yeah, this came up last year. Rather than have to pick all your runner beans when they're green and young before the seed forms, uh, this is really, if you've got a freezer, you think, oh, I've got to get as many runner beans and chop them up and freeze them. Don't, don't relax, don't panic, because if you just leave the runner beans on, they'll get beans inside, and instead of eating the green pod, you eat the bean. And the bean is actually the bit that's got more nutrition and protein in it. Uh, and yeah, all the runner beans, if you cook them enough, you have to eat, cook them like, like kidney beans. Make sure they're cooked on, so the outside uh, doesn't kind of poison you. But yeah, uh, <laughs> half an hour cooking and they'll just form a regular bean. So that's worth doing. And then this is this Polygonaceae family, which is a bit weird, and it includes rhubarb. And that's the forced rhubarb, had a cover over the top of it. They're only just starting outside now, but that stuff costs you about 20 quid in the shops now because they're all trying to get extra money for it. Uh, and sorrel as well. I don't know whether I've got a picture of sorrel here. Just see. Yeah, this is silver sorrel and there is an example of that here somewhere in one of the uh, containers here. Yeah, here I've got three types of sorrel. That's what I'd call French sorrel, uh, but actually this is the same sorrel that grows in the fields and it'll indicate slightly acid soil. We've got a lot of it around here. And then a smaller leaved version of that is this uh, buckler leaved sorrel. This is only just starting to emerge at this time of year. Smaller, lemonier, and actually nicer than the regular sorrel. And then I've also got blood sorrel, which is very beautiful uh, cosmetically. Not quite, not such a nice taste, more like a beet leaf as a taste. But the three of them, three different types of sorrel. And then we're on to the composite flowers. So all these little flowers in the middle They'll all form a seed. There's the marigolds that have gone to seed. So each head has now got a, a cluster of lots and lots of seeds on it. And this is a cardoon gone to flower. Uh, so it's, again, ornamental, quite a large plant. 
you eat the leaves and you really have to force them. You have to do like we did, with, like I've shown with the rhubarb, to get really good eating off them. This is a radicchio, <coughs> and a different type of radicchio, a bit like lettuce, but very bitter. Uh, good for stimulating your appetite, okay mixed in with other salad, and then it's down to individual kind of uh, uh, preference as to whether you can tolerate the bitterness or not. This is another form of chicory. This is actually one that we grow, we can eat the leaf, but it's actually grown for the root. So you're trying to grow a decent sized root uh, one year, and then you lift that root, bring it indoors, and you force it indoors in the winter. And if you're living in the middle of a continent like Russia or America, where it gets properly cold in the winter, you'll be able to get out and lift in the thing for about four months in the winter. So anything that you can lift, take indoors, force, and then you get little greens, or it's the forced white Brussels Whitlow chicory that you're after. Here's a globe artichoke, same family. And then we're into slightly other, other territory, two types of plant which are both called the vegetable oyster. And I think this is one is salsify, and I think, yeah, that one is scorzonera. Scorzonera is a hardier plant than salsify. And I lifted some of those today. These are salsify roots. And actually, without the mud, there's quite a decent amount of food on there. Uh, they've got as much nutrition as carrots, but little taste. If you boil them and then bake them or fry them up, they, they, they do turn out quite nice. Salsify. So that's the flowers. And when those form, uh, they've got little parachutes like dandelions attached. So if you don't collect the seed within a day or two, they'll all blow away. Uh, that's good. And then we're into the labiate family. So this is where the lower lip of the flower is extended a bit. That's just regular garden mint. That's ginger mint. That's one of the latest, one of the nicest to come up there. This is the mint bed that we did at Unston to get the benefit of. They want lots of moisture, so excess moisture off the tunnel and we fertilise this bed really well. After a few years, this is two or three years old, they start to crowd each other out, and you need to move them on, get them re-established somewhere else, otherwise they'll end up getting mint rust, rust on the mint, if you leave that bed for more than five years. And then just showing the characteristics of this family, that's actually catnip, and that's regular nettle. This is a small-leaved and really vicious type of nettle, but they've all got a square, square stem, and pairs of leaves first going off one way and then purple and at 90 degrees the other way. So if you recognise that characteristic, and this one is oregano, uh, which we'd use on pizza, slightly different from marjoram. And there's golden oregano, which is a nice plant. And related, but only an annual, these are the basils. This is lettuce leaf basil. These leaves really are seriously about as big as my hand. It's nearly life-size picture. Whereas these leaves, they're life size as well, and they're only about a centimetre long. This is Greek or bush basil, and it forms a lovely clump. That's just one plant, and what we're after is these end shoots, the bits that are going to flower. So that is really good value for money, and also it's slightly hardier than the previous other types. Uh, so that would be, you could have that in a pot, and you'd get a year's supply of basil genuinely from one, one pot. And there's uh, a red or darker opal basil, this one. That has stronger flavour than the others, so it's worth growing, but it is a bit fussier and harder to grow. But gorgeous plant. And what was the one before called again, sorry? We had, uh, we've had lettuce leaf, yep. Greek basil, or bush basil, that's the best one. And this is Siamese, I think it is. And it's put a lot of energy into flour, not so much energy into leaf, and it's slightly spicier, lovely for Indonesian cooking. And that's the lemon basil tiny leaves again, but the lemon flavour, especially from eating this, the flowers, they're absolutely gorgeous, lemony flower. And just to highlight that, same family, but a different growth habit, this is the perennial, which drops its leaves in the autumn. Can Renata tell me what that is? That's the lemon verbena again. So flowers with long flower stems out here, and the leaves we've had for tea, and the flowers you can have as well. And then, yeah, Still in the same family, or oh, actually this is uh, 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 the umbellifers again. It's carrot, carrots, that's one I grew large by accident. Uh, and then, yeah, different types of carrot. Sweet Armenian, that was the best for bulk. And there's wonderful yellow, that's easy to grow. And the white one, that's a fodder carrot, so that's dead easy to grow. More like, a bit more like a parsnip, but 
bit in between the two. All worth trying. And this one, beta-3, that's got extra beta-carotene in it. So uh, that has got uh, extra vitamins that will be good for you. What have I got over here? Uh, yeah, I've got a, a roundish carrot, an orangish carrot, and a white carrot. The parsnips in the same family, they've got a good depth to them. They're starting to get a bit of this orange stuff, canker. They've been left in the ground all over winter. That get, deteriorates as you leave them in the ground. And then in the same family, anybody know what that one is? Here's a bit of, here's three different types of parsley. Well, there's the flat-leafed Italian parsley, that one there, and the curly-leafed parsley, which we, it's harder to grow, but it's more familiar to us. So again, the Italian flat-leafed is easier than what we think of as parsley. This has got the same shaped leaves, but it's actually a root crop, and that's Hamburg parsley. So we don't eat the leaves, they don't taste as nice, but the root, just as a standard vegetable, if they're big enough, or for flavouring, that's really good. And let's just do a few more. Uh, if anybody would like to get some tea together, Mick, can you do some tea? Brown pot, just stick all that in, maybe wash it first when I've got the tea. And yeah, for storing carrots, this is storing them in leaf mould. So if we're going to have either a really cold winter, and the frost will penetrate down into the soil, or if I've got slugs around, or mice, or rats, and they're going to come and eat the crop in the ground, I'll lift the crop at the end of the year, store the good ones, and then these are actually my reject ones that I'm going to eat up there and then. So I've got some for immediate eating, some to store for three or four months into the winter. And that's classic umbella for flower. Uh, that's the carrots going to flower. And again, hundreds and thousands of seed from each plant. Parsnips. And see the, diff see the similarity in the leaf. This is celery. And I've brought you a few leaves of celery. That's how big they are at this point in the year. So they're just coming along. They're kept alive in the polytunnel through the winter. But that has flavour. If I put that in a soup or stew, that gives me good flavour. And the same plant, because they've survived this far, the next lot of leaves will grow full size again, <coughs> foot long. And I'll have a proper... Like, so celery and also fennel, we think of as summer crops. They grow really well during the summer. But if you can keep the plants alive, they're biennials. So they grow from one year to the next. And that then becomes a vegetable which, instead of uh, yeah, just having a very brief appearance in summer, that has cropped all the way through the autumn. So I've had four months cropping from it last year. It stops through the winter for a couple of months and then picks up in the spring. And I'll get another four months eating from the same plants the next spring. So about eight, eight months of eating from the same plants. Celeriac, slightly harder to grow. That's the root version of celery. But again, when the celery leaf has stopped growing, if I've got some root celery that I can lift, and that's hardy enough to go through the cold winter, leave it to ferment a bit, Mick. Just leave it in the pot for five minutes. Give it a minute to stew. And yeah, so that's not just celery, but also adding celeriac on as an extra crop. To grow a really good crop of celeriac, you do need to plant them out about two foot apart, and you're hoping for a root you know, bigger than a tennis ball, all the way up to football size if you're lucky. Uh, so that's fennel grown as a summer uh, stem root vegetable, stem vegetable, and that's what we think of as fennel. Uh, the fennel I've brought today, that's actually been left again in the ground, the same kind of thing, and it's regrowing the next year, green uh, fennel. But I've also brought a different type of fennel. This is bronze fennel, and that's a perennial herb. So I don't have to go to the trouble of extra fertility and pumping it up and trying to grow a huge big vegetable, because most of us, if we try and do that, uh, it's likely to bolt and go to flower before it gets to this stage. And again, it's another crop which, unless you know what you're doing and you do it fairly well, you could waste your time on. But growing just the herb fennel, you get the same flavour, and especially at this time of year they're shooting, without going to all the trouble of trying to grow it as a, 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 a challenge of growing it as a big, big vegetable. This one is dill. I absolutely love the smell of dill and dill pickle, really nice. And they went through the winter inside a polytunnel, but outside they wouldn't. Uh, but yeah, a very divine flavour there. And then same family, this is Angelica. And you can see the red at the bottom, and this bit on the stem, that's what you'd candy. Candied Angelica? Yeah, green on cakes sometimes, used to be. 
But the stuff that on cakes, that's just basically sugar uh, gel. And it hardly got the flavour of Angelica. When you make your own, and you have to boil it in sugar three or four times to get it to preserve, but the flavour of that is like 100 times greater than what we're used to as Angelica. Uh, lovely big ornamental plant. And then this is the Chenopod family, beetroots, in this case grown all in the clump together. These are just standard summer round beetroots, which tend to be very dark purple. And when you cook them, the purple goes into the water. Uh, I've grown several different types of beetroot. This, you can see, is a different shape. It's tankard shaped. It goes down into the ground. This is a winter beetroot. So because it's growing more down into the ground instead of above ground like that one, that will store into the winter much better. And anybody want to hazard a guess what this big bugger is? Mm. Got any idea? Sugar beet. Mm -hmm. And that's illegal to grow because if I get a disease that then gets passed on to a, a commercial crop, they wouldn't like that. But um, that will taste like saccharin. They have that, ah, it gets to your back of your neck, uh, back of your throat. So it's not that nice to eat, even if it's cooked, but that's what they extract and process and work on and you know, put through a factory process to extract sugar from. Sugar beet. And let's see what else we've got here. Different types of beetroot. Some of these got dark leaves, that's bull's blood. Uh, that might be more like the sugar beet. Others have got red stems in the leaf. Uh, that's the deep rooting one that I brought there. So just within beetroots, a whole load of different categories. And again, for continuity, you could have summer beetroots, round ones, and then winter ones, and ones that store right through. You can eat the leaf of beetroot, but they're a bit of an acquired taste. And that's this sliced up uh, Damien Hirsch, Hirsch beetroot. Mm -hmm. But related to, that's the Swiss chard, same family. And also, yeah, that's a mangle wurzel. Again, it used to be for fodder for animals. So if we're keeping stock, that's the kind of thing we want to grow. And then there's true spinach. So what I've just shown you, leaf beet, you can eat the leaves, especially if you cook them up, but they're not half as nice as proper true spinach, which is reflexed kind of outwards and downwards, slightly prickly. And winter spinach, I bought uh, some of the shoots of the winter spinach that's grown outdoors through the winter. And that's really gorgeous to just stir fry and uh, fry up. But much nicer than just leaf beet, but leaf beet's easier to grow. That's strawberry spinach, which has little flowers uh, and then fruitlets, which are round and look like strawberries, taste just about like strawberries if you can fool kids into it. This one is tree spinach. You can see the little purple bits. That's on the young shoot that's just emerging. And that is a mechanism to protect that young growth from ultraviolet radiation. Can you believe it? And also, it does rub off. And then, again, with kids, you can use it as eyeshadow and makeup and mess about. It's a, a little granular uh, powder that's just on the leaf. It's not the colour of the leaf, it's just on the surface, like I say, to protect it from ultraviolet. And there's red auric, which is a lovely plant. You can either use that as a salad or cook it up. And then we're into the potatoes. Early potatoes, that would be in about the start of May, in a raised bed, double raised bed, inside a polytunnel. They're ready to crop now. They've finished flowering. These ones are on the point of flowering, so the earlies, will s there'll be some tubers in there if they're early varieties. But if they're main crop or late varieties, we'd have to leave them longer till after flowering and when they're dying down to get the maximum crop back. Say, uh, Solanaceae family, this is tobacco, and that's about six foot high. And that's henbane. So if you're keeping chickens, you don't want to have henbane. But it's a very beautiful plant. Has categories, uh, characteristics of uh, Solanaceae family. Different types of tomatoes, yellow ones, big ones, small ones, striped ones, green ones. That's Scarlet Knight, which is this local heirloom variety which has been growing around here for at least 50 years. It's a standard salad tomato, but uh, because it's been grown locally, I like to grow that. That's the pineapple tomato, which is, again, the larger the fruits, the less you get on a plant. So you might only get half a dozen plant fruits, if that, on a plant. But worth growing if you can show off. That's one I call green sausage. It's, uh, yeah, that's the ripe one there, just going slightly yellow, streaked and elongated and long. That does well in a pot. And then aubergines, fussy, fussy plant need extra warm conditions. That's a really good crop from an aubergine. And they're all young and glossy, they haven't gone over, so that's the point at which to pick and eat them. 
If you leave them too long, the seeds are forming inside, and that's when they go bitter. And different types of aubergine, some long green ones and some whirly ones, and white aubergines, generally much nicer than purple. The purple is bitter, especially if you buy commercial ones. And black uh, bell pepper, and then different chilli peppers, and just one or two illustrating. These are chilies in pots. The pots will get the sunlight, and that will make it warmer. So chilies want warmth, but this is actually in the greenhouse with a grapevine. This is a grapevine growing over them and shading them. So although they want heat, they, they can tolerate a bit of shade inside a greenhouse. And that's a whole lot of different varieties. Courgettes, I like to just grow as an early crop and have maybe half a dozen courgettes before the squash kick in, and then I'll switch over to squash. Uh, making sure we get pollination. Uh, that's a young plant in a mound of improved soil, and this, again, watering moat, so that it can get lots of water in there as and when needed. So we actually shaped and sculpted the soil to suit that plant. And they ramble, great for growing up and over hedges, or even over walls, and trailing habit there. That's the Marina de Chogia, which we've tried before. And another one, and a double, courge, double cucumber. Sorry, did you say courgettes and then you can plant squashes afterwards? Well, I eat courgettes for an early time. And then as soon as the winter squash are starting to come on a bit later, I'd switch over to winter squash and not bother with courgettes. Right. And yeah, with courgettes, the advice is don't plant more than two or three plants. If you've got about half a dozen plants, so some weeks you'll have 50 courgettes and you'll give them away to all your mates and they'll say, actually, I've got a couple yeah. dozen, you know, I've had enough courgettes, I have enough to think. And then little uh, cucumbers, short ones and spiky still, which is a fairly wild habit. That's, they're actually gherkins, a, a type that's been grown just for gherkin. So you pickle them. And then melons, uh, that's tours netted and black rock. And you can see the difference between that's an unripe fruit compared to a ripe fruit. And you smell, you press the end, and when it's soft, it's ready. And then you smell it, and you get this lovely musky smell. I'm going to have to stop there, otherwise we'll run out of time. Mix made some tea, pour the tea. And that will give me just enough time to do the planting calendar in the second half. Can we take some of these things over there? There's oatcakes and nibbles.